Right. So, first slide. So, I would like to welcome all of you to the seventh edition of the online education series. This is the seventh one. And uh, we have other flagship projects about which I'll tell you now. Uh, DFOOT International, as you all know, is a registered international nonprofit association under the Belgian law. And it's based in Belgium. Next slide. <clears throat> Our mission is to end avoidable lower limb amputations due to diabetes worldwide. Next slide. We work closely with many organizations and our sister concern is the International Working Group on Diabetic Foot and the ISDF. And I welcome all of you to the Olympic Games of I, the Diabetic Foot, which is the ISDF, which is happening between 10th and 13th of May, uh, 2023. And we have a workshop and also a mini symposium uh, in the ISDF. We are an implementation arm of the IWGDF. So the IWGDF comes up with guidelines every four years. And we, DFOOT International is supposed to implement it in different countries. Next slide. We have several flagship projects. One of our flagship project is the Train the Foot Trainer Program. This happened in the Southeast Asia region um, a month, two months ago, or one month ago. And it happened in the Southeast Asia region. And these are glimpses from the uh, Southeast Asia region Train the Foot Trainer Program. And we had our T-Foot International Board led by the President-elect Dr. Zulfi Karabas, who took part. And it happened in Chennai in India. Next slide. Another flagship project of ours is the Online Diabetic Foot Awareness Week, which was started two years ago. And it happens between 7th and 14th of each year and last year as you can see this is the picture of what happened last year it's very important because it covers the entire seven regions of defoot international from the saka region african region africa nac region north america and caribbean mina region middle east north africa southeast asia europe western pacific and we have one day dedicated to the global meet where we have speakers from all over the globe taking part. Next slide. And these are the these are the glimpses. These are the glimpses of what happened last year in 2022 from various regions, as you can see. So this is one of our flagship project. The train the foot trainer is another flagship project. And here we ensure participation from across the globe. Any other, any other slide? Next slide. And uh, we have a dedicated YouTube channel. So soon after this today's program is over, we will have the same program uh, put into our YouTube. So you can watch it. Even if you missed it today, it doesn't matter. You can watch it in our YouTube pro in, in, your, in our YouTube channel. We also have a Facebook, uh, very active Facebook account for the Food International. Next slide. Yeah, thanks. So today's program is basically a case discussion. We wanted the East meeting the West, and we've invited all our regional chairs to take part in this case discussion. We will try to finish it in one hour because many countries have fasting uh, going on due to Ramadan. So we will uh, try to finish it in exactly 60 minutes. So the first page, the first case is going to be presented from the Western Pacific region. And I would invite our Vice President, Professor uh, Hari Krishnaya, to introduce the case presenter. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijay. It's a pleasure to be here. I think uh, our case basically is more of a learning experience. So we'd like to just show. Key, can you uh, put up your slides? All right, sure. Uh, hold on. 
Dr. Key basically is our uh, is a doctor in our wound care unit in the Department of Internal Medicine uh, in Kuala Lumpur Hospital. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we get the referrals and all that quite uh, what they call it often. So basically here is to show East, Miss West. That means I'm trying to actually show some of the uh, problems that we have and how we actually uh, have to manage some patients. You know, Next. Next slide. Oh, sorry, I couldn't uh, share my slide. We will do it. Okay. All right. Next slide. This is the ambulatory care center where the specialist clinics are. So uh, the uh, Department of Medicine, basically, we have got our own uh, physician clinic plus the uh, wound clinic also in the same building. So we are on the eighth floor of this. Next. Dr. Key, you have the floor? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so a little bit about, about background about this patient. Uh, next slide. He's a 71 years old Chinese gentleman. Uh, he's uh, ADL independent, but using a walking stick to walk at home. Uh, he has an underlying history of diabetes, high blood pressure, and dyslipidemia for the past 30 years under a district health clinic follow-up. Uh, he is an ex-chronic smoker, about 50 pack years. Um, and he's married with two children. Uh, prior to this, he worked as an air traffic controller in a civil aviation. Next slide. So he initially presented to us, um, he initially presented with a past discharge from between the nail and the right big toe whilst vacationing in Dublin. That was about at the end of November 2022. Uh, this past discharge was associated with redness and bleeding from the right big toe. And he actually consulted a private GP in Dublin and he was started on antibiotics and dressing. Uh, he was advised for admission there in Dublin. However, he wanted to return to Malaysia and continue further treatment here in Malaysia. So upon returning to Malaysia in the beginning of December, he visited a private GP and was advised for a nail avulsion. So that was around 3rd of December. Post nail avulsion, his wound actually worsened and turned blackish after about two months of uh, consistent dressing at the private GP. Hence, the private GP actually performed an ultrasound doppler of his uh, foot and noted there was poor circulation. And he was subsequently referred to a vascular surgeon in a private hospital, Dr. Vijay at Hospital Asunta, uh, Kuala Lumpur, for further management and an angioplasty was done. However, the patient still um, had persistent resting pain. Next slide. Um, Further, uh, after the admission to Asunta Hospital, um, he was referred to our wound care clinic for further management of his wound. Um, he was uh, in our own wound care clinic. We noted that the pain on his lower limb was persistent and in, in fact actually worsening with an ABSI of 0 0.4. Hence, we ordered for an urgent CT angiogram and uh, referred to a cardiologist uh, for a lower limb re-angioplasty. And uh, the angioplasty and angiogram was done in Institute Jantung Negara, IGN. And the, note, the findings were noted as below. Um, the right superficial femoral artery and popliteal artery was patent. The anterior tibial artery and posterior tibial artery of the right femoral artery was 100% occluded and there was severe stenosis of uh, about 99% of the proximal peroneal artery. Hence, a balloon angioplasty was done to the proximal peroneal artery. Uh, Post-angioplasty, um, fortunately, had no more resting pain and was discharged with oral unesin for about two weeks. Um, next slide. So this is just uh, the summary of the timeline of events. Um, of his illness. So it basically uh, last, I mean, is we are still following him up in a wound clinic. So about four months into his, uh, from the first initial presentation in the November, 2022, where he initially presented with past discharge in Dublin. Subsequently, he visited a private GP um, in Malaysia on the 29th of November, and he had a tone, uh, done a toenail avulsion, and um, subsequently was referred to Asunta Hospital uh, in view of his poor uh, circuit, in view of the abnormal ultrasound Doppler findings, 
Hence, uh, angioplasty was done in Ansunta Hospital and he was subsequently referred back to the private GP where the private GP referred to us, wound care team in HKL for further wound management. So um, at that time, again, uh, just to recap again, he had persistent resting pain over his right lower limb. He's, uh, therefore, we referred him to vascular and uh, IGN as well. So in IGN, Institute Jantung Negara Malaysia, he done a percutaneous transluminal angioplasty. Next slide. Okay, I think uh, this case actually, maybe if we go back to the back, the next, uh, the fast slide, please. All first right, day. if you look at this, basically, they went to the private GP after coming back from Dublin. So here the problem basically is, uh, what do you call that? Uh, if you can see, the GP did an avulsion without examining the patient in the terms of actually looking at the pulses, looking at the blood supply, basically maybe even ABSI. So none of these was investigated before he did the avulsion. So after the avulsion, basically what do you call that? Uh, you find that the whole leg, the whole uh, hallux basically became black, gangrenous or that. And then interestingly, uh, later Dr. Key will present about the uh, findings in uh, the CT NGOs and all that. All of it shows diffuse blockage for all this while. So in this particular aspect here, I would have expected that at least at the GP, instead of sitting there for two months, they should have gone to, uh, I mean, to actually refer fast. Instead, you see, they end up, what you call this, in a different hospital, then from their hospital back to the GP again, GP back to what you call this, us. And then from us, basically, we actually got the, uh, IJN is actually our National Heart Institute because our cardiologists also do a little bit of angioplasty for the distal aspect. So it's not done by our vascular guys as much, but because our vascular guys at this point were actually thinking of more of a baloney amputation because of his blockage and all that. So, next slide. So, I want to put up this to show the fast track pathway. So, here you can see basically what they call this patient with the diabetic foot ulceration. At least at that stage, basically, you know he's already severe and all that should have referred fast because it's not a stable DFU. And the thing is, he's already got blockage, but we already wasted two months basically at the GP after coming back from Dublin because there must be something uh, sinister there because in Dublin, the plan was to admit. But finally, when he came back to the GP practice, basically, he was not sent to the hospital to admit or anything. And they continued the dressings there, you see. So that's a bit of a problem. So this pathway being the flagship of the D foot is very important to at least have our GPs to refer as quick as possible. That's one. Number two is basically the multidisciplinary team approach. So what happened basically is you need a whole team to uh, actually help out. So in this particular case, we need to get everybody involved. Next slide. So here you see the patient was actually in primary care. So from the primary care, they actually send him to the uh, interventionist, which is actually the vascular guys and all that. They have done what they call this, uh, an intervention by doing angioplasty. Unfortunately, basically, even though they found that he was supposed to be successful itself, but we found that, you know, as soon as after that, he was still having that. There wasn't much uh, difference. So this part, basically, the possibility of uh, maybe restenosis or basically what they call it, I mean, the flow is not back to normal again. So what happened is, they had to refer to wound team to actually look after the wound, basically. But I was in the impression that, you know, we need to do something uh, actively for this patient. Because, so we did what we just disarticulated the joint. And then I also sent to the cardiologist to actually do an uh, angioplasty. Because our cardiologists are trained in Boston before this. So what happens is they are quite aggressive in uh, doing, uh, what do you call that, uh, distal angioplasties. So important, basically, we all talk about, Mike Edmonds do it, talking about uh, 40 years of multi team approach. But you find that, you know, in the general practice itself, that's not being uh, done until he actually came to our hospital, which took about close to three and a half months before coming to our hospital. So you see, there's a delay in the referral system, same as what has been shown in uh, Europe and everywhere else in our studies before. All right, next. Um, so, for moving on to his uh, examination findings, um, during his first visit to our clinic uh, back in end of January to early February, um, he's, a, he's a teen uh, gentleman with a blood pressure about 168 over 75. Um, his cardiovascular findings were, there were no significant findings, no murmurs. Neurologically wise, um, power over the bilateral upper limb and lower limb were full. Uh, reflexes, however, they were reduced uh, in the ankles bilaterally and um, vibration 
with the tuning fork, actually there was reduced uh, sensation, um, reduced vibration sens sensation over the right plant plantar foot. So uh, pulses wise, the right leg, there was no palpable posterior tibial artery pulse, but there was a weak uh, dorsally speedis pulse. The ABSI over the right leg was 0.58 monophasic wave, uh, whereas the left leg was 0.7 monophasic wave. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is the progression of the wound in our wound clinic in H uh, Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Um, the first uh, diagram on the left is uh, during his initial presentation on the 7th of February, where I actually complained of resting pain. Oh, sorry, uh, just move. Uh, just uh, the same slide. Yeah, thanks. Um, the right leg, the right leg ABSI was 0 0.4, left leg was 0 0.4. Subsequently, after about a week, um, uh, you can see the gangrene, uh, the right toe is gangrenous. And on the 16th of February, there were more exudates and slough was increasing trend. And that time, we actually repeated a CT angiogram on the lower limb and as well uh, referred to IgN for angioplasty. Um, next slide. So uh, on the 22nd of February, from the, the right, the diagram on the left side, um, the CT angiogram on the lower limb was done, and subsequently, uh, the findings, I will be mentioning it in the later slides. So the one in the middle is the toe gangrene that we which uh, was after the angioplasty done in IGN. Uh, and on the 6th of March, this was the day 7 review post-angioplasty. Uh, pain was much reduced, uh, however, the it, Fortunately, the ABSI was also improved. Uh, previous ABSI was 0 0.4 and improved to 0 0.8. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so on the 15th of March, uh, the big toe was actually disarticulated. And uh, this is the base of the wound that was uh, sloughed. And um, we start, and this patient had actually completed uh, unestin for about two weeks of antibiotics. And uh, following that, on the 22nd of March, uh, this is the latest wound uh, finding. Um, there was still persistent slough and also um, greenish biofilm. So we started him on ciprofloxacin and uh, changed the dressing to RTD and nanogen. Um, next slide, please. Uh, right. So this is the summary of the investigations and the imaging done. Next slide. Hematological parameters wise, or uh, I have two, I have three find three readings. Uh, first, during our initial presentation in the wound clinic, um, he has a total white. His total white cell count was um, not raised. Uh, was always persistently about eight to nine, but his uh, CRP was high, forty four point one. Um, his kidney functions, however, uh, were normal. Uh, his ESR is about one one five. Uh, his uh, HbA1c is about 6.9% in February this year with a normal thyroid function. His fasting sugars uh, around, were around 6 to 7 also at home. Um, and next slide. Next slide, thanks. So this is the first CT angiogram of the lower limb, which was done in Hospital Asunta where he was referred from the private GP. Um, sorry if you all can't read, but I'll just read it out to you. So the right artery, uh, the popliteal artery is actually patent, but there's actually arteriosclerotic changes over the superficial femoral artery. Um, the significant finding was uh, occluded posterior right tibial artery with a uh, distal third good runoff and a patent peroneal artery. Um, so hence, at that time, the angioplasty was done in a hospital, Asunta. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this was the repeated CT angiogram of the lower limb in, H in hospital Kuala Lumpur. So basically, uh, there was a diffuse bilateral uh, arteriosclerotic disease of the lower limb arteries. Um, but uh, the summary of the findings were basically slight improvement in the vessel caliber and stenosis of the right superficial femoral artery and the right popliteal artery. However, the occlusion at the proximal posterior tibial artery uh, were unchanged with the vessel reconstitution reconstitution distally. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
So the final uh, intervention done by the IGN was a percutaneous transluminal angioplasty. Um, the findings as uh, noted here, the, the superficial femoral artery is patent. However, um, the anterior tibial artery was 100% occluded at the proximal segment. Uh, and this was where the angioplasty was done. And the peroneal artery, there was severe stenosis, 99% at the proximal segment. Hence, a uh, um, balloon angioplasty was done. Uh, right, next slide, please. So hence, um, this patient is actually having diabetic foot ulcer, University of Texas classification grade 3B uh, with a Sinbad score of five. And next slide. The reason why we use the, what they call this, uh, Texas is because under the CPG guideline of Malaysia, they're still using Texas. But I thought that it's good to actually put Sinbad because that's the actual uh, scoring used by the IWGDF. And it's important also basically when we look at the uh, launching of the next, uh, what they call that document between uh, May, 8th, May 10th to May 13th in The Hague. Now, interestingly, what happened in this particular case, you find that the patient has refused what they call his uh, baloney amputations and all that. So we had to actually do another angioplasty in a short while because of worry that there was such a re -stenosis. So luckily, what they call is the cardiologists were ag aggressive enough to go in. Now, on top of that, basically, we also put in adjunct therapies. So we use microcurrent therapy because patient also had a bit of swelling of the legs. So swellings reduced, the pain was better, perfusion has actually increased. So microcurrent therapy is actually uh, an adjunct therapy. Now, even though I'm covering all these adjunct therapies, in terms of the levels of evidence, if you look at the IWGDF got documents, basically, it is what you call that uh, of uh, low evidence because it's not a full uh, metal disease or even uh, randomized control trials. So it has been more of what you call this uh, real world evidence or clinical trials. So what we did is we actually put on microcurrent therapy. We also put on photobiomodulation. That means we put them on lasers, our four wavelength lasers, which is actually supposed to increase the, uh, what you call that, uh, the uh, preservation of the vessels and also angiogenesis. And then the blue light, basically the LED light was actually the uh, one from Italy, photobiomodulation to actually increase what you call this, the fibroblast and all that. Microcurrent works on the nitric oxide. So that is a very potent vasodilator. And I think 1998, uh, nitric oxide was actually uh, given the uh, Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Prize for uh, what do you call that, for the function as a potent vasodilator. So we treated the infection with the uh, antibiotics. And now currently he's still on uh, debridement and all that. So the plan is actually if we can, what do you call that, uh, try to escape by uh, what do you call that, clearing this uh, infection and uh, closing the wound. So far you can see there is no, what do you call that, uh, creeping, uh, what do you call this, necrotic tissue or even gangrene at the, at the site. It's uh, arrested at the place. Now we need to clear the infection. So both infection and ischemia in this patient. And the thing is, if you see even in the second angio angioplasty basically done in the National Heart Institute, if they couldn't, what they call is open up everything. It was still blocked up at the peroneal and all that. So they only had, could open up uh, to a ex certain extent to allow a little bit of uh, flu uh, what they call it, blood to go in, at least some flow, some semblance of flow so that we can close the wound itself. And patient has to be very, very careful after this. That means in terms of uh, all aspects. Next. All right. I open the floor to discussion. Thank you. Dr. Vijay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, uh, Harry and Dr. Key, for this presentation. Finishing five minutes ahead of time. So we have our guest, Dr. Prashant Vas from, and we have uh, Dr. Jose Braver. Our you know, my first question, can I, if I have the. Uh, if I have, as a chairman, uh, the first the question asked, suppose you have infection and peripheral artery disease, which will you deal first? Will you do the nail uh, debridement and then the peripheral artery disease management? Or will you do the revascularization first followed by the infection control? If you have both together, anybody can answer. Prashwas is, uh, Prashant Vas is also there. So, if you have both, Harry, uh, hi, Prash, you're muted. Oh, hi, I'm just going up the stairs. I, 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 jo I joined in as a, as a, as, as an attendee rather than a panelist. So thank you for upgrading me. Um, so. If you have peripheral artery disease and infection, which will you deal first? 
Will you? So, my perspective is infection is the number one. What would have changed over the last 24 hours also would be the severity of infection. So attending to that is number one. And often it's the struggle in hospitals when as soon as they see peripheral arterial disease, they'll say, oh, we need the vascular team treated with antibiotics. There's necrosis. This is severe infection. Getting rid of the infection is number one while you run the vascular plan in parallel or within the next 24, 48 hours. Because the, the vascular disease would have been there last week and the week before in, in, in a classical diabetic foot ulceration, for example. That's my view. Thanks, Klaus. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Bravo? Dr. Bravo, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. The absence of diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease is very common worldwide. Um, uh, and this is a very important case. I, we, I, I think that we have to insist in fast track weight, that is a clinical tool to identify one severity and reduce late referral. This is my comment. And I have to pray to answer to Professor Nair, how, or how long after the angio did you perform the amputation? Actually, what you call this, uh, as soon as uh, the patient came to us, we did it uh, immediately. Because the thing is, there was already infection at the bottom there. But at the same time, we did the referrals to the National Heart Institute also one shot. So it was done within the next few days. So as soon as they've got the supply back, we amputated. Because okay. the thing is, what Thank I you. wanted to show is, if you see here, the patient from Dublin then went to the GP. Then from GP, basically coming to us took two and a half months. So patient actually sat there for two months plus with a peripheral vascular disease. And then they, after the nail evulsion, it became gangrenous. So, you know, any, uh, what you call this, uh, injury or any instrumentation to a vessel, to a leg, which has got in peripheral vascular disease, I would say severe PAD would actually cause this. So they should not have uh, kept it that long, should have referred much faster. Yeah. Thank you. I have actually uh, the fast track pathway was developed by DFoot International along with a couple of other partners. I have put in the chat box where it was published. We had Jose Luis Martinez, uh, Marco Meloni, and Rahul. I'm sorry, from Kings, we had Srivastava. Uh, so we had some authors in the paper. So I think the fast track pathway is very important. My second question, if there's no other further question, is fast track pathway, is it applicable in, in private practice? Will you refer? Or in, in a NHS, it is possible. In, in Rome, it's possible. But in a private practice, if you refer, you are asked questions about why did you refer? So you can't say that we don't have vascular surgeons and all that. So, so Harry, uh, the fast track pathway, is it is it a good model in private setup, private hospitals. Yes. yes, actually it is. Because the thing is, when you look at the fast track pathway, it is not sending from one center to other. It is actually basically sending, making sure that, you know, you're referring to the speciality which you need to actually uh, get on board. So if, let's say, in a private sector there, basically in a hospital, you have got the vascular surgeons and uh, you've got the foot and ankle surgeons or even the parietal surgeons there, they should be able to manage the patient in a proper uh, multidisciplinary team approach. That means, who is the gatekeeper? Maybe at the emergency department. There's one particular hospital where the emergency department has got a vascular unit there, basically. So the vascular registrars come down, they assess the foot first. If there's no blood, goes to vascular. If there's sufficient blood, they goes to orthopedics. So they divide it at the emergency itself. And then while in the ward, basically, what they call is endocrinology is also called inside, basically. So we go in also to actually control the sugars and everything else. So we have got our physicians there also. So at least, you know, a holistic approach. So this fast track pathway is something that anywhere it should be done. Just in case if you're worried, like you know, sending it to a government hospital might take longer or whatever. At least what they call is if you can uh, send it off to the uh, relevant vascular specialty or uh, whichever specialty it is, as soon as possible, be helpful. It's always good to actually have a few people working together. I mean, that's the reason why we have, you know, in King's College, we've got a very good team there, basically, and also in other parts of the world, basically. At least, you know, you have got a whole group, so we can easily manage these patients well. So it is not only from centers, but so rightly, if it's a GP clinic in a private sector, he will not be able to manage this. 
So he has to refer early. So that's yeah, important. I, I didn't get the name of Raju Alu Alia. He was the other co-author in the paper on fast track. You had a question, uh, Prash? No, I, I wanted to sort of uh, make a comment in support of what uh, um, Harry was just saying. Um, really, the, the, the whole fast track pathway um, from 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 concept to sort of translation is 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 the philosophy of care, isn't it? That rather than the structure of uh, care, and as long as that is embraced anywhere in a GP setting or a private hospital setting, and as long as the individual physician surgeons involved can escalate this um, in a in a in, in the right time, that's good enough uh, and and timely enough. Um, even even in this case. Um, what is evident is this is a slowly progressive emergency. That is the thing about diabetic foot. And often you can be deceived and sometimes, um, you know, lulled into a, some, you know, a false sense of relief that things are getting better. Um, and that's what you want to avoid. Um, and and the, the next step beyond the fast track pathway um, is that the ultimate center that takes on these cases, the specialist center has its own internal, you know, fast track algorithm for things. So you literally have two fast track pathways going in hand in hand. Um, and, and this is the challenge for our patients. They fall through the loop here and they can fall through the loop at, at even a, a, a tertiary institute sometimes. So it's, mm -hmm. it's closing these two pathways um, is the, 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 the next challenge for, for us, I suppose. Uh, physicians. Um, for us at King's, we are very lucky. Yes, the NHS pathway uh, works relatively well, but it's still still not perfect because we still get patients late um, and late for different phenotypes. Yes, for a small ulcer, um, we may be, they may be sent late because the patient are presented later. But we get very complex patients referred after two or three bypasses, 10 uh, angioplasties elsewhere. We would have loved to see them a lot sooner. That is our challenge. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Gabriela, one minute uh, before I ask you the question. We have Simon, we have Roberto, we have Linda Pedroso, we have Abbas. Any comments from you all before I ask Gabriela to talk? You are muted, Abbas. I'll, I'll just to add to the what discussion has been done. We had uh, launched uh, our national guidelines where we had put a mark where, uh, first of all, that every doctor should be able to uh, at least examine for peripheral arterial disease and peripheral neuropathy. That is a must. Secondly, there is always a level where they should refer, whether they are starting at the primary level, district, regional, zonal, or a referral hospital. So we have made a cutoff point. For that reason, suppose if this was a case, this should have been directly referred to a, at least regional uh, for the first step. And if the regional fails, then it should have gone to referral hospital. So whatever be the structure, that's irrelevant, whether it's private or a government, but the, they should follow this system. It's been one year so far, so we don't know, we don't have the outcomes as yet, but this is what we have already put, government has already put in the system on diabetic foot. Thank you. Any comments from Simon Robert? <clears throat> Linda Pedrosa, before we go on to the next case. Just a very final comment. Um, this is something that we see that it's from a simple lesion, then a devastation can come if the intervention doesn't, uh, doesn't take place in a prompt way. So this is a very good case in a <laughs> lesson to that we should use to uh, teach all the GPs and all nurses that nothing can be considered simple when we see a lesion of a person with diabetes. Simone, yeah, go ahead, Simone. Unmute yourself, yeah. Yes, my only comment would be that um, the fast track system, obviously we don't have that yet in the Caribbean. Um, we don't have those standards. It's so unfortunate. It's a great, great case study to show how important it is but it would be pockets of care and that will be pockets of private care for those who are familiar with the standard or fast track system. That, so it will re really depend on where that patient presents and what 
system that that private clinic may have in place in order to support that case. Um, under normal circumstances, a case like that will probably would have ended up with an amputation here in the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, Gabriela, you wanted to say something? Going back to what is first, uh, peripheral arterial disease or infection, I think in this case, uh, the very ischemic foot uh, was first because you can hospitalize these patients, treat with antibiotics, and wait to uh, do the, the revascularization and then do the minor amputation. I think this is, in this case, it, it could uh, wait the infection part. Yeah. Uh, Harry, you want to answer the question in the Q&A box? Uh, there's a question by Alistair Hunt. Has a private uh, in Malaysia. A private GP in Malaysia were educated or mentored about the nail avulsion when the vascular supply was not suitable. All right. Actually, what you call is uh, we have uh, quite a number of uh, trainings for them. And even in under medical student time, also they should know when there's a peripheral vascular disease, you're not supposed to do any of this instrumentation. You should assess first, you see. But the thing is, in this particular case, because he thought it very simple, something just came up to what he called it to yeah. him, like a simple injury and all that. So just avulse the nail and everything is done, which they do as a day-to-day -day thing. But only problem is that's why you find that, you know, in terms of foot assessments, so in, in even in the uh, fast track pathway, we always recommend to do foot assessments, a simple testing, yeah. at least loss of perceptive sensation, neuropathy assessment, vascular assessment must be done. A quick one can be done. So in this particular case, basically, I think most of them know, but the thing is, there's still a lot of work because sometimes all I can say is sometimes they have an excuse that, you know, it's a very busy clinic and therefore, you know, it's unable too many patients run back, side, left, right, center. But that is, I, I don't think there's an excuse because like what uh, Linda mentioned also, it's diabetes. It is not what they call this uh, a simple disease. It is multi-organ problems and all that. And very commonly what has happened is, I'm sure all of you all remember, when we were medical students, only 10% of ischemia. Now it's already 40%. And in some bad. So we have to be very, very careful. First thing is a patient who comes in with diabetes, you must assess this. So that, I think, is the problem that they have, they have forgotten. And mm -hmm. it's not like, you know, only the first time. They kept the patient there for two months, two months plus before referring. That itself shows yeah. the delay. It's just simple dressings on and off, hoping that the dressing will actually, you know, uh, solve the problem. It doesn't. So the problem here was at the assessment itself. Uh, Roberto, any comments from you, Roberto? Roberto. Good morning. I think that uh, the problem is a remain uh, time, the concept of time is tissue. In every moment, in, in primary prevention, in uh, during this situation, and then in secondary prevention. For us in Europe, with the healthcare system public, it's a quite uh, easy to have a good uh, approaches with this kind of patients. So, in fact, we looked at we have a less number of amputations in comparison with the other countries. So, the problem is a pathway. First, a second, a, a fast track pathway, and then a connecting in the pathway between a general practitioner and the, and the specialist uh, altogether very earlier. So we can find, we can approach the situation. Thank you, Roberto. Perhaps you wanted to say something? Uh... Well, I, I was just listening to the Reith lecture yesterday, uh, and Joe Mills was talking on it. And, and this issue is not just uh, um, localized to one or two countries. This is a global issue. It's an issue um, in whatever health setting, how well resourced it is. And if you look at um, a, a, a Joe Mills' own area um, in Texas, he said there are, there are kilometers and miles and miles of counties that have no single uh, vascular center. They almost call them vascular deserts within the middle of yeah. 
access. So access to these patients is very, very tricky. And I think it's the challenge everywhere. And then there is revascularization, and then there is revascularization. Um, some centers are only able to do X amount, while the patient may need X, Y, and Z doing before you take the toe off, for example, in chronic ischemia. Because if you do suboptimal revascularization, you take the toe off after that, it can still get worse. And, and Roberto and, and I were chatting at DFSG, I think it's about this challenge. Um, so many layers to overcome. It's difficult to capture it in one, one talk or one session. So such a huge challenge. Um, uh, the vascular disease of diabetes is becoming. I have one question to, to Harry. Um, in, in Malaysia, um, are people allowed to take toenails or touch anything uh, in someone with diabetes without a preceding vascular scan? Because a toenail, yes, it could be ingrowing toenail and an infection, yeah. but, but, but it could be a sign of ischemia, isn't it? It's on the top. It's not a classical yes. diabetic foot. Why should an elderly person come to you with that problem? Uh, how does that work? Yeah, that's a the problem. There's no what you call this uh, uh, hard and fast rule that they have to do it. It is something that, you know, it is a must that it should be done, at least, you know, a simple basic assessment. But unfortunately, the thing is, we've got quite a lot of GPs out there. So it's a bit of problem to actually uh, look at all of them. But in the hospitals also, usually what you call it, sometimes if you have got the younger medical officers, they might not check. But usually what we do is in our um, orthopedic clinics and also in the medical clinics, we have got the topless. But in the peripheral side, we just had a meeting last week with the ministry. What has happened is some of the health clinics don't even have Dopplers. They end up actually using a Daptone to actually, what they call it, get the ABS size and all that. So that is a bit of a problem now. That's uh, at least, you know, with a simple handheld Doppler, they should be able to assess. But not all uh, clinics have that. That's a problem in, uh, I mean, in Malaysia at least. And oh, I think most okay. of the world also. I think in the interest of time, we'll have to move on to the next case. Uh, so I would request our Vice President, Dr. Hermelinda Pedrosa, to introduce uh, Dr. Gabriela Caro. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Vijay. Um, indeed, it's a very big pleasure to introduce Dr. Gabriela Caro, who is a physician with a specialization in internal medicine, also in diabetes, and she has a specialization in wound healing care as well. Currently, she has been coordinating the diabetic food unit at the National Hospital, named Professor Posadas in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dr. Carlo is a very, very active uh, physician in SACA, and she has been playing as national representative for diabetic food and has contributed a lot to its publications and discussion in our group. Welcome, Gabriela. Thank you very much for this presentation. And thank you for your help. And to Daniel Braver too for the invitation. I apologize for my English, it's not as good as yours. So we can start with the presentation. I, do I share the screen? Oh, are you sharing? Well, uh, the next slide, please. I am a physician at the third level hospital in Argentina, which has 500 hospitalization beds, uh, all specialties and complementary studies. This is a public hospital, which means that patients don't have to pay for the medical treatment or surgeries, even if they require hospitalization. Uh, this is my hospital. We have laboratory, mass diagnosis service, hemodynamics, operating theaters. One of the biggest hospitals in, in Argentina. But, uh, well, uh, but in spite of the large number of physicians that work in this big hospital and the variety of specialties, only a few of us want to treat diabetic food patients, you know, it's uh, an overshadow uh, disease. 
Uh, so this unit uh, mainly comprises three di diabetologists, a podiatrist, and an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, we can work with hemodynamics, uh, vascular surgeons, and internal physicians in a transdisciplinary way, but they are not uh, specially devoted to diabetic food, but they do other things, other uh, diseases. In our department, we have rotating residents, students, and young doctors from across the country who are studying the area of wounds and diabetic food. And we enjoy and love our work. The next, please. Uh, we receive in my hospital between 20 and 30 medical appointments per day and around 20 diabetic food attacks per month that require uh, urgent surgery. They ha have a high risk of amputation with a limb threatening infection. And from all patients we uh, receive, 25% have severe ischemia that needs urgent revascularization. And this is a problem, as you said, uh, in the other case. It is difficult to revascularize, uh, revascularize the patients. Next, please. Well, uh, I'm going to present this clinical case of a 58-year-old man with a history of diabetes for many years, treated with cliburid and metformin, hypertension in treatment with enalapril, and he has been a smoker for many years. He had no controls of his diabetes uh, from years. Uh, he didn't go to a physician to control his diabetes during a lot of years. He was a next smoker. Next, please. Uh, he had a diabetic foot ulcer for months, but he did not pay attention to this situation because, as you know, it, it, this uh, doesn't cause pain. And during the last 15 days, he noticed it got worse with erythema, perlin, discharge, edema, bad odor. He consulted to my hospital on July 27, 2022, with an infected diabetic foot attack that compromised mostly lateral and dorsal aspects of the foot from the tooth to the leg. And he had been to other hospitals and professionals in four opportunities before he got to our hospital. This is very uh, often also because patients go to a lot of physicians and institutes uh, previous to the consult, and uh, they got worse with uh, bad treatments. The next, please. Well, as you can see in the photograph, uh, in the dorsal effect of the foot, he had necrosis, abscesses, slough, uh, erythema, edema, and this spread to the leg with a large compromise of deep tissues. The next, please. Uh, in the relevant finding, he had positive pulses, an ABI of one, and he had uh, five classifications. We do the classifications with an app in the telephone that uh, gives us the results of five classifications at the same time. This is St. Elian score of severe, a Wi-Fi amputation high risk, and very low benefit of revascularization. Texas 3B, ITSA severe with osomyelitis, and uh, Simbad 5. The next, please. It was a foot with a severe infection and high risk of amputation for all classifications. This was the laboratory when he uh, get to the hospital uh, with leukocytosis, anemia, hyperglycemia, renal impairments, and a high C-reactic protein. Uh, he had hyponatremia too. The next, please. He had his first toilet uh, or the breadman. Uh, bedside in the emergency room performed by us, the di diabetologist. There was no surgeon available. There was no uh, surgery room available. Uh, yes, here uh, to do this procedure. So uh, we did it bedside. And then he had a second treatment in the operating room, but uh, both they were no uh, enough to solve the infection completely, as you can see in the, in the second uh, photograph. Uh, he started vancomycin twice a day, piperacillin, insulin, and uh, subcutaneous cuparin. Uh, the next, please. Well, uh, he had a third, a third one toilet. It was done by our orthopedic surgeon, Michael, and he did the resection of the fifth two and the, uh, left a large wound, but this allowed starting an advanced wound healing. He resected all infected tissue and bone. 
um, from this uh, surgery, he took um, a culture, a, a bone a fragment for culture uh, in this uh, surgery, a remaining bone uh, fragment. The next, please. Well, after this surgery, this third surgery, the laboratory improved and Escherichia coli and Streptococcus agalactiae were isolated in the remaining bone. Uh, given it sensitive, patient could be discharged on August 10th with cefarexin and amoxicillin and followed up with a, a C-reactive protein and a nitrosurate sedimentation rate uh, as an outpatient. And he was hospitalized during 14 days. The next, please. Well, this table shows how laboratory values have evolved during the hospitalization. Creatinine values slightly improved, but he had renal impairment. Uh, and glycated hemoglobin in such value could be a consequence of anemia. Seriatic uh, protein improved uh, dramatically after the third, uh, after the third uh, surgery. The next, please. Uh, here, uh, I couldn't get the first uh, radiograph, but you have the uh, radiograph after the surgery, how it was, it had been evolved uh, during uh, this month. Next, please. He had uh, some bone fragments that you see uh, left in the, in the foot. Well, after that, uh, we started the, the debridement and healing process as an outpatient. Uh, he started treatment with amniotic membrane on uh, uh, October 3 of 2022. Next, please. We cleaned the lesion with saline solution with the right edges and laugh. We treat the edges with, a, we said, water past, past allow. I don't know how you say it, uh, past we think, or I don't know how you say it uh, in your countries. Uh, this amniotic membrane um, is homogenized and lyophilized and prepared as dressings. Homogenized means to make a uniform preparation by physical treatment, and lyophilized is a freeze drying technology. It's a water removal process using the uh, preserving preserving the materials. In this case, growth factors uh, of the amniotic membrane. The next, please. The amniotic membrane comes from the placenta of a cesarean delivery. A process of lyophilization and homogenization is carried out, uh, which allows the growth factors to be distributed uh, throughout the dressing. The dressing is left on the wound for three days and integrates with its bed. In order to perform this treatment, I had to be authorized by CUCAIBA, which is the organization that governs organ transplants in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Amniotic membrane dressings measure six uh, per six centimeters and it can be put with the hands like if it was a host uh, in the church, uh, it, it looks like a host. Um, the patient can put it himself at home. That's why uh, how we put it, we can put it in, uh, in little pieces or, or as you saw in the other slide. The next, please. Well, the wound has been closing since then, and uh, the next. That is how it looks nowadays. He's not taking antibiotics anymore. The next, please. Well, antibiotic treatment was stopped in 26, in December 26, when the C-reactive protein and erythro sedimentation rates were normal in range. As uh, an outpatient, he was diagno diagnosed of having proliferative re diabetic retinopathy and diabetic nephropathy with albuminuria. This is the treatment, the current treatment he is taking by now. And this is the last laboratory uh, we have uh, from him. Uh, the glycemic, glycemic control is uh, much better now with insulin. Next, please. Well, this slide shows how a uh, C-reactive protein decreases dramatically after the third surgery and is near normal, uh, 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 near normal value two to three months uh, after the surgery. The next, please. 
Well, here is the editor sedimentation rate that has a slower decrease during uh, five to six months to get to normal values. It's slower than the uh, reactive C protein, as you see. Next, please. And the last line shows the percentage of the wound that has closed over time. The velocity of wound closure was higher at the beginning of the treatment, and then it slowed down. The mean velocity of closure was 0.6% per day. That is slower than the other patient we are treating with amniotic membrane, uh, that is 1% uh, per day, uh, approximately. 14% uh, of the wound was still open at the last visit. And uh, we think that uh, larger um, wounds are slower, have a slower velocity to close because the last part of the of the healing process uh, is slower. So the mean velocity uh, slows down. Well, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gabriela, for the wonderful case. And we'll take up questions. We have 10 minutes. Uh, we have the first question from Dr. Brava from Argentina. Dr. Brava and Dr. Mariam. Yes. Uh, we would first, like to... first of all, I would like to congratulate my friend Gabi for your presentation. And again, you avoided an amputation. You are facing yeah. in the case of an infected diabetic foot attack. Your treatment really what is very innovative. Uh, could you explain how the treatment works and how often do you change this form and if, the, if this amniotic membrane have or has some contraindications? Uh, well, this uh, membrane, uh, uh, it's left on the on the wound during three days, and it releases growth factors to the wound that uh, um, that arises the velocity of wound, clo uh, wound closure. Uh, okay. If the patient has cancer, you can't use it, or if the patient has uncontrolled infection, or uh, you have debrided it uh, correctly, uh, okay. it is contraindicated. Okay. Thank you, Gabi. Linda, questions? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Gabriela. Very interesting case, and uh, it's not very usual to have this facility of applying uh, amniotic membrane in, in regular basis. I wonder uh, if this patient, of course, I presume he had. Uh, because I didn't see any neuro neurological examination, but considering that he was uh, approaching the emergency room, perhaps he didn't have any sensation. And second, uh, why, did, why did you choose the amniotic membrane instead of graft? Could you comment on that or if you have an experience comparing the two approaches, please? Well, uh, in the first uh, in the first point, uh, we use uh, turning fork and monofilament to uh, to know if the patient has neuropathy. But uh, instead of uh, but uh, beside it, the patient had no pain. Uh, he came he came to the emergency room without pain with that large uh, one. So. Uh, this patient we, we see in the hospital have uh, no sensations. Uh, they have neuropathy, all of them. Uh, but yes, we, we perform turning fork and uh, monofilament. And in the second uh, question about um, this, uh, this treatment, the skin graft, uh, it is difficult to explain. It's Argentina, you, you won't understand it. But, uh, as I said before, this is a public hospital and there are long queues of people waiting in surgery room availability for oncologic and other surgery. So diabetic foot is not a priority in my country. Uh, in fact, diabetic foot patients have long in hospital stays waiting to perform a major, a major amputation. Uh, between one and two weeks waiting for a major amputation. So. Uh, to do a skin graft to this patient is not a priority. 
Uh, so considering uh, skin graft means several months of, of waiting, we choose to do other treatments as, such as plasma rich platelets or this amniotic membrane. Uh, we don't have the possibility to use negative pressure either. So we use what we can. Okay. Miriam, uh, Dr. Miriam Botros, any in Canada, do you use amniotic uh, membrane? We do. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gabriella. Excellent case. Uh, and really, I, I echo what the other uh, commentators uh, and experts have mentioned. Uh, you really did an outstanding job in saving uh, this very complicated foot. Uh, so uh, we do use amniotic uh, tissue uh, placements. And uh, the thing that I was, do you wait till the infection has stabilized before you initiate it or do you initiate it early on in the treatment? I initiated when uh, when infection was controlled. Yeah. He had still an osteomyelitis with erythrocementation rate that was high at that moment, but it was controlled and it was slowing down. So we, cho we chose to do that because uh, the wound was granulating and uh, we had that osteomyelitis under control with a bacteria that was sensitive to antibiotics. Yeah, in in our cases, we would we would wait till the osteomyelitis, but obviously this is a clinical decision. So, and do you find a difference between initiating early on IV antibiotics versus oral antibiotics in your practice? Pardon, I didn't understand the first part. Do you find a, a, a difference in these specific complex, hard to heal wounds in initiating IV um, antibiotics versus oral antibiotics? Do you find that the patients respond better to IV versus orals? In this case, that he was he had a diabetic foot attack and that he had to have at least yeah. one to two surgeries we choose to hospitalize this patient and give an uh, IV antibiotics of high spectrum, piperacillin or imipenem plus vancomycin because it is a um, uh, limb threatening infection and a life threatening infection. Yeah. And then when this is controlled and we have uh, the result of the culture, we um, change to oral antibiotics if we can. If the, uh, if the bacteria are not sensitive, then we have to uh, give a second surgery. Ash, you want to ask a question? Uh, your yeah. hand is. Qu question and answer and, and a few things. Uh, but fantastic case, Gabriella. I mean, I, 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 you know, this 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 leg has definitely been saved because of sort of emergency. You know, this is a proper fast track. What you've done from from once they've come to hospital, they come to hospital late, but then you're done done. I mean, from our side, we often in these cases don't look for neuropathy if they're allowing a podiatrist to hack it with a scalpel, you have loss of protective sensation, your diagnosis is there yeah. right in front of you. You don't need even a vibration perception threshold or a monofilament. Monofilament is there to look for risk of infection. This is beyond, this is there. Um, that's one. Two, um, in our head uh, for severe foot attacks, um, we we always have to go for, I think, intravenous antivirus, life and limb affecting yeah. infections, I suppose. Um, and 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 you really don't have the 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 choice of actually going. What you need is someone like John Wick going in there and 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 killing those bugs. Um, but your best antibiotic in this instance is actually the scalpel. And no matter how much you pour in, without that scalpel and that initial necrosis clearance, you will struggle. And the fact that you layered it with the antibiotics. That's been fundamental, I think, to, to this. My question to you is very similar to what Dr. Pedrosa asked you about the, the, the skin graft side of things. And I understand, I think you guys have, have a challenge with getting those graft. I would have asked the same question because that would be standard. It's a very large wound. Um, I don't know how much uh, 
um, um, placental membrane uh, 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 in applications costs there, but they cost a bomb in the UK. Uh, literally, we could bankrupt our NHS just yeah. for that one foot, I think. Um, but you know what? Our surgeons, vascular surgeons and our orthopedic surgeons are able to do skin grafts. Um, and it might be something for you to think about as the next step of devil. You have Michael now, and maybe Michael can learn to do skin grafts, even if he's successful 50% of the time, compared to a plastic surgeon being successful 80% of the time, you're still on to a winner for these big, really big wounds. Yes, of course. This, uh, this amniotic membrane is cost effective for us because we don't have a surgery rooms to do that procedure. Not we have a surgeon, uh, an orthopedic surgeon, not Michael, that he does this um, this screen graft. Uh, in fact, we have uh, three experiences uh, in heel wounds, and uh, they they have another ulcers after this screen graft was performed. So uh, in the heel is not uh, an election treatment. But uh, it is difficult to, to perform uh, this treatment because we don't have uh, any surgery rooms to do that. Okay. Yeah, Brendan, we have a question from Rodney Juliet. Uh, how long has the healing process, uh, how long uh, does the healing process take? And have you considered using back? and or split screen up. I think it's, it's already answered in the Q&A. Uh, uh, this patient uh, started with the treatment with us that he went to the hospital on 28th of July, and then he's treated, uh, he's, uh, he has a 14% uh, left of the wound now in March. So it, it takes a lot of months uh, to to heal the the, the whole wound, uh, but well, this was a high, very very high risk patient. So uh, we we do the treatment and and wait this to to heal. We don't have any options, other options. We have the IWGDF wound healing uh, document coming up on May uh, May tenth May thirteenth, I think, and brush is a part of it. And we will see what they would recommend in the wound healing section. So Prashvas, Prashant Vas is a part of it. I'm also a part of it. Is a part of it. So we'll see what's. Uh, Professor Shakavi, any questions? No, thank you. I just joined late because the internet was not working good. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you have to break your fast now, very soon. <laughs> soon, yes. Any more questions from the chairs? No. Okay. So Abbas, uh, you would like to, we had a good attendance. We had 184 people. Uh, so thank you so much for taking part. And uh, thank, word of thanks by Abbas. Yeah, thank you, Vijay. Uh, this is the first webinar of its kind, East meets West, a discussion about diabetic foot management in various regions of the Foot International. The idea of this webinar was came from our president, Vijay, so thank you very much, and it was very well attended. We would also like to thank the presenters from the Western Pacific region under supervision of uh, Professor Harry and Dr. Key. Uh, Hello. And And that's from Saka region, uh, uh, Dr. Gabriela Caro presented under the supervision of uh, Linda, who took their time from the busy schedule and accepted the task of conducting webinar. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, yeah. both of you, all of you. I would like to thank all the board members of DFOOT mm -hmm. International and obviously the regional chairs of DFOOT International for working hard to get this program running smoothly all over the world. Special thanks to the core team of Diabetic Food Webinar Education Program for the Secretariat and IT, which has been provided at our President's uh, Office, Dr. Vijay from Chennai, and especially Seval Kumar for his wonderful job, which we can see. 
So all of you, very big thanks to you. Finally, and which is the most important, I would like to thank all the delegates which uh, attended and we reached up to, like you heard from VJ, 180 plus, because without them, no webinars are possible to be yes. successful. So a very big thank you from left, from bottom of my left ventricle, all of us from D4 Internet. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>